What's up guys, Rick here with your DFS preview for this week's Waste Management Phoenix Open, an unbelievable sporting week. This event obviously ends on Sunday, which also happens to be Super Bowl Sunday. So a lot of great betting options for this week. You're gonna have props coming out your ears. And I figured why not create a prop that we can use to give away some subscriptions to rickrungood.com. That's my golf data site. It's where all the tools that you see in this video are. Uh, and really all the videos that I put out on the channel, all the tools that you see are from rickrungood.com. So here's what the prop is going to be. You can either take the winning score at the Phoenix Open in total strokes or Joe Burrow's passing yards in the Super Bowl, which will be higher. So let me put this into perspective for you. It's a par 71 around TPC Scottsdale. Four rounds of 71, that's 284. Obviously, someone is probably going to be 10, 15, 18 under par. So maybe you're looking at 274, 268, something like that. You can have the side of the winning score or Joe Burrow's passing yards, whatever side that you want, put it in the comment, which one is going to be higher. And I will choose two winners for year long subscriptions, but otherwise it's going to be a fun week. Let's jump right into it. Let's start with the course and it's TPC Scottsdale. We know this one very well. It's a par 71. It is going to be played on Bermuda grass greens. There are only three par fives out here. That's how we get to the par 71 with two of them coming late on the back nine and you throw in the drivable par four down the stretch as well. And there's just kind of a lot of risk reward and a lot of jockeying that is going to be happening in the final few holes every single round. So when you get to Sunday afternoon, this thing could be a toss up. We saw the absolute chaos last year with Brooks Kepka, you know, chipping in late and, and, and stealing this golf tournament. And it's not unusual to see that live betting during this event is honestly one of my most favorite things because there's so many different things that can, that can happen. I don't want to, I don't want to bring up the James Hahn disaster that was, that was last year, but I'm sure somebody will get it out, get it out of me in the, uh, in the live chat this week, which is Wednesday at 3 PM Eastern time. Historically, this is the uh, course key stats model. So this is me running a regression model of every single course on the PGA Tour, every player that played that course, and every stat for that player for the given season. And it looks at the type of golfers that have had success at every single course. TPC Scottsdale, couple of stats kind of reign supreme here. Strokes gained approach. The sixth uh, most correlated course to success for strokes gained approach. That does not mean players who play well this week or who hit the ball well on approach this week are going to find success. It means that historically, the types of golfers that have had success at TPC Scottsdale have been good approach players that season, right? So it's a, it's, we're kind of building a mold here. It makes sense. Uh, stroke gain off the tee is 10th. Strokes gain tee to green is 9th, as you can pos as you can imagine. Um, you know, driving accuracy is not necessarily a highly correlated stat to success, but it, it is one that I will keep a close eye on this week because when you play desert golf, and if you are hitting it wayward in in desert golf courses, um, you can you're just kind of more at the luck of the draw of whatever lie that you're going to get. Are you behind a cactus? Are you in a bush? Is your ball sitting on a rock? These are things that um, you you don't control once you miss the once you miss the fairway. It's not like you're just sitting in three inch rough and you know what type of lie you're going to get. You're a bit more out of control and there's a bit more luck involved. So guys that are super wayward off the tee, um, I'm a bit more concerned about this week just because it's going to ramp up the volatility just a little bit. I have the uh, kind of scoring averages and the fairway and greens percentages because I know a lot of you are playing props. There's no better week to play props. I'm doing it on prize picks. I'll talk about that in just a second, but this is such a fun way to play. So here, here are the stats for TPC Scottsdale. These fairways are harder to hit than the average on the PGA Tour. So they're about the 22nd most difficult out of 51 uh, courses. So that's a, a little bit above average in terms of difficulty. About 59% of the time players are hitting the fairway. Greens and regulation much easier to hit. About 72% of the time, that's 41st out of 51. So basically the seventh or eighth easiest greens to hit. Birdie or better, uh, closer to middle of the pack. That is 22.7%. And then scoring average, 69.4, which is again, um, one of the top, 
eight or nine easier courses when it comes to pure scoring average. So if you are playing props, if you're considering, um, you know, showdown and things like that, th those are the stats that you're going to want to look for. Um, I will show you the new tool, which is a prize picks tool that honestly, this is maybe one of the best tools I've ever done in my entire life. I love the way this works. Um, so basically what it allows you to do, if you haven't played on prize picks, it's, it's props. I enjoyed the hell out of it last week and I'm going to crank it up again. I couldn't do it without a tool where basically you're choosing round by round. Are they going to hit more or less fairways, greens, uh, fantasy points, which is just the score that they make or birdies. So I built this tool to pull in the lines from prize picks and then you can decide how many rounds you want to go back and it'll show you the likelihood of each golfer going over or under each one of their lines. And it does take into account the golf course. So TPC Scottsdale has already been loaded in. So very, very quickly, if you go to the last 20 rounds um, and you look at fairways here, this will recalculate. It might take a second. It's a, it's a pretty big file. You'll see that Victor Hovland is 65% uh, likely to hit over nine and a half fairways in round one. And you can kind of just scroll through these and see which are the bigger numbers. Kevin Kisner over nine and a half in round one. Um, you can find some guys that are closer to unders as well. Brooks Kepka under eight fairways. That's more likely to happen uh, than not. And then you can go to um, you know, scoring average or birdies or greens or whatever other one of these props that you want to look at. Uh, so for example, Justin Thomas's line for round one is 67.5. That's close to 50-50. Louis Oosthuizen probably goes under 68 and a half, 56% of the time. So you can mess around with this as much as you want. See how many rounds that you want to go through. Um, this will update constantly throughout the week, but it's one of my favorite tools and I know it's going to come in handy for, for props and it's going to come in handy for, for different formats that you might be playing. Um, so I wanted to build something for it. So I'm pretty proud of it. If you do use my code Rick at prize picks, it's a 100% instant deposit match up to hundred dollars. And, um, I get paid on that. So it is, uh, good for me. Good for you. Good for prize picks, I suppose. Um, so I think it's a win, win, win. Good luck. Okay. Let's take a peek at the cheat sheet here. And oh boy, we've got a field. Got a very good field. I think it's 18 of the top 30 players in the world, three of the top five players in the world. John Rahm leads the way. He's one of five golfers over $10,000. So John Rahm is 11.6. Justin Thomas is 11,000. Patrick Cantlay at 10.7. Hideki Matsuyama at 10.4. And then Victor Hovland at 10.2. We're starting to see, I think, maybe a little bit of better pricing on John Rahm, right? He's getting a little bit more expensive. That gap of $600 between him and Justin Thomas, it is... Um, I guess reasonable, but I still think that the argument that you that that you probably make is the way to deploy John Rahm in the current moment feels like for DFS formats and betting him outright is a lot more difficult because even when he finishes third at the Farmers, I believe he was in the optimal lineup. You know, 14th at the American Express, second at the Tournament of Champions, he was probably in the optimal there as well, and and that's all without victory. Now, of course, he's got uh, the great course history with just piling up top 20 finishes. In fact, he's never finished outside the top 20 at this event. And, um, yeah, he's one, he's one of the guys at the top that has a lot of, a lot of, um, really good results here. So I think I'll, until kind of proven otherwise, it's, it's, you play John Rahm for DFS purposes and you probably don't bet him. And then when he wins twice and you wipe the board, he, you know, he wipes the board and takes your money and outrights, you just kind of live with it. Um, Justin Thomas, he is probably, the most interesting guy in the $10,000 range for me, he's kind of in the sandwich pricing between him and uh, between Rom and Patrick Cantlay. So if you go over and you start to dive into Justin Thomas and really the last year, because that's how long it's been since JT has lost strokes to the field. So here I am going back in his results. The last time he lost strokes to the field in a tournament was the Genesis. We are coming up next week is the one year anniversary of the Genesis. So we're basically a year into him never losing strokes to the field. And what we're seeing recently here is the absolute elite iron play is back. If we go back to the course key stats, what's important here? Approach play. What does Justin Thomas do better than basically everybody else? Approach play. The putter is becoming more inconsistent 
which I think is a good thing. You know, we saw him gain a stroke at the Farmers. That's not in, uh, that's only three measured rounds at the South Course, two and a half strokes at the Tour Championship, four and a half at the Northern Trust. Yes, he's going to lose uh, with the putter often, but seeing some opportunities to hit for him to be a zero or something close to it, I, I think is the blueprint for success. And he has his own great history around here as well, right? He's got a, a 13th place finish last year, two third place finishes before that, a 17th in 2018. I mean, it's just been a really, really good stretch of golf. Um, I mentioned this the other day, Patrick Cantlay is a problem. Uh, and, and I mean that for the rest of the PGA tour. So let's just do the last, uh, let's do weighted strokes gained last 50 rounds for everybody in this field, because we do have ROM in this field. So I think it's fair. Okay. So this is weighted. This is using strength of field uh, for every single round, a variety of other factors to kind of say, you know, did they play well in big events? Did they play well when the best players got together? John Rahm, head and shoulders, the number one player in the world. Three and a half strokes gained per round. Patrick Cantlay is second, two and a half strokes gained. They're the only two guys over two strokes per round. So it is, it is to me very, very clear that Cantlay has solidified himself as the second best player in the world, at least for this kind of like power rankings type of situation that we're dealing with right now. And I didn't even think he played all that well last week at Pebble Beach and he finished fourth. Now you could argue it was a weak field, yada, 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 whatever you want to say, but um, Patrick Cantlay is going to be a problem. I will probably just uh, take my chances on Hideki. I've been super impressed with how Hideki's been, right? He's got the win at the Zozo, the win at the um, at the, the the Sony. He's he's won this event multiple times. He's been constantly uh, near the top of the leaderboard, but it's just kind of an awkward pricing. He's probably the pivot play. When we get to Wednesday for the live chat and we get to see what his ownership is, maybe sentiment will, will change on him and he'll become a really good uh, leverage play in the 10Ks. But, um, you know, if you let me have... The other four, Rom, Thomas, Cantlay, and Victor, I think I'll survive with that. Victor, listen, I, I, I'm a not, a no longer a biased source of information or unbiased source of information on Victor Hovland, but here's what I can tell you. The last uh, five events, which by the way, since he came on my podcast, uh, he's won three times, right? Mayakoba, he defended uh, Hero World Challenge, which was probably a 250 in the, in, in strength of field, uh, the Desert Classic in in Dubai, uh, and then a fourth place finish in, in Abu Dhabi as well during that stretch. He's just he's just phenomenal uh, to, to to try to show you how good this 20 round stretch has been. I'll go to the weighted stuff. Let's do weighted strokes gain in this field last 20 rounds. Yeah, see Victor 16th. He gets a little bit of a knock because um, you know winning at Mayakoba is not the strongest field around. Uh, winning uh, a European tour event, not necessarily the strongest field around, but they were good fields. If you go raw data, Victor is actually second uh, in this field in the last 20 rounds behind just Patrick Cantlay. So short term, Victor is that dude. So um, the way that I see this shaking out, I really don't know, honestly. We're gonna have to wait and see because Hideki is gonna get the course history bump. The other guys, I think maybe Cantlay goes overlooked because he's kind of boring and people will be excited to get to Rom and Thomas and Victor. Maybe it's Cantlay that goes overlooked. I think the $10,000 range is, um, based on you building lineups, w will be dictated by ownership. And I think that's fair to say because you're not gonna be able to get all these guys into your lineup. We'll see as the week goes on, but they are, they are priced in that range for a reason. They've all been really, really good. The 9K range is fascinating here. So Spieth last week goes out, almost wins at Pebble. That was the big question. It was recent form versus course history. Apparently course history prevails. And what I saw from Jordan Spieth last week is it's, it's good signs. Let me pull up his golfer profile here, because remember, this is a very critical time of the year uh, for everybody, but for particularly for Jordan Spieth. And we saw him make a run here uh, last year. So when they played this kind of in opposite order. They went from they went from uh, Phoenix to Pebble Beach last year, and this is where he had uh, a T4, and then he played well at Pebble Beach. And this kind of kicked off his run of really good play last year. But this is exactly what you want to see statistically from Jordan Spieth. I got to admit, the you know, close to zero off the tee, be a one, be a one. That's what he was last week. That's great. That's all he has to do. And then what we saw at Pebble beach was essentially what we saw all summer long where he was just piling up strokes gained on approach. Now this is only two rounds. Remember that he had, um, basically his third best approach round ever 
on Saturday at Pebble Beach and then backed it up with another good round on Sunday. Uh, gained two strokes putting over two rounds. Like, yeah, this is this is the stat profile that you want to see. And if you get more and more of this, uh, Jordan Spieth is going to make a lot of noise in the next couple of weeks, months, and for the rest of the year. Um, I, you got to have some question marks around the next three. Shoffley, Kepka, Burns, or I guess next four, Berger, right? Berger will likely be your leverage option because we don't know, right? He withdrew Wednesday evening uh, before the Pebble Beach Pro-Am in his title defense. He has, as of right now recording this, still in the field. Um, maybe someone will ask him about his health uh, at some point this week on Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, but he has three top 10 finishes in his last uh, five trips here. He has four top 10s in his last seven trips here. Um, he's played well. He's been phenomenal coming in, and it's really just a health situation. So if you're willing to take on the risk, the reward of Daniel Berger seems to be very, very large. Uh, Shoffley, Burns, and Kepka. I think it's a good spot for Burns. He hasn't played as well as I would like to have seen, but he's always got that upside. Xander, what are we doing with Xander? Because if Xander is, you know, top five player in the world, Xander Shoffley, he's being mispriced. Now, do we think that he is currently in that form? Well, not particularly. He hasn't been bad. He just hasn't been great. So he won the Olympics. Then he's, you know, lost strokes a couple times after that. And then he finished fifth at the Tour Championship, which is a small field. 18th at the CJ Cup. 28th at Zozo. Those are small fields. 12th at the Hero. That's the bottom half. 12th at Century Tournament Champions. There's only 38 golfers there. He makes the cut at the Farmers. He makes the cut at the Saudi. It's just like, these are fine. These are great results. But if you're a top five player in the world, top 10 player in the world, it's not the best stretch I've ever seen. Now, the good news is um, his waste management history is is pretty darn good. I think it's all top 20s here. Yeah, so runner-up last year, T16, T10, and T17 in his four trips to this event. So I could probably go either way. Um, in terms of excitement level, I'm probably a 4 out of 10 on Xander if 5 is kind of average. But... Um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know what to really make of him. Now, Brooks Kepka, on the other hand, let's look at Kepka because he's your defending champion. But since this event last year, I think we're going to find a lot of inconsistent, yeah, we are, uh, and, and quite frankly, for, uh, poor play. He has lost strokes to the field in, oh boy, uh, six of eight, and the two that he gained, he gained less than one stroke per round. Or no, that's in total. Less than one stroke uh, in total. So it's not super great. I, I worry about this, right? I worry about the approach play column. I worry that he's lost strokes off the tee in three straight. I worry that he's lost strokes around the green and putting. I mean, this is just, a, it's a not sharp, it's a not sharp version of Brooks Kepka. Um, now, can he, can he show up and win this golf tournament? I think he can. So here's where I'm kind of standing on the nines. I think you have to be excited about Spieth. I think you can take a volatile, high, uh, high upside approach to Burns. I think that you can wait and see on Berger. And if we can get any indication of health, which I think is going to be hard, but I think that's high risk, high reward to get access to Daniel Berger. Um, and then we round this out with, with Scotty Scheffler and Bubba Watson. And... You know, Bubba played well at the Saudi International last week. He finished one shot behind Harold Varner the third. I'm pretty optimistic for Bubba moving forward. He's played well at this event before. He finished runner-up the last time he played it. Um, uh, Scotty Scheffler, wow. No, I'm on the wrong guy. Here we go. That's Now I'm hovering over the right guy. Yeah. Bubba's got uh, three, four top fives in his last six years. Is that right? Yeah, something like that. Seven years. Yeah, he's he's been he's been great at 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 waste management. So um, I would definitely work Bubba into the mix. I also think that Bubba's kind of in an awkward situation when it comes to pricing because he is. Um, I think people will. Exp I think he's maybe too expensive, right? You look at Finau and Louis and Fitzpatrick and Webb and Connors and Power and all these guys below him. You wonder if people are going to pay for Bubba, which makes it kind of an interesting little pivot option as well. And just to put a bow on Bubba, this is um, this is the holy grail here. So this is everybody in this field dating back to 2008. 
uh, at TPC Scottsdale. And Bubba has, of anybody who's played as many rounds as he has, he's played 52 rounds. He's got the best strokes gain total number, 1.68 on average. That's right where Justin Thomas is at. And JT's got less than half of the rounds that Bubba does. Ricky Fowler's close, right? Ricky Fowler's played 42 rounds. He's at 1.7. Hideki's played 29 rounds. He's at 2.3. So it, it really is uh, a pretty decent Bubba spot Um as well, and it's been a decent Louis spot. Louis can kick off our 8K range discussion. He's 8,800. We haven't seen him in quite some time. He's only played here twice. He finished third and he finished T11, gaining two and a half strokes per round. Uh, I imagine most people are going to take kind of a slower approach to Louis because we haven't seen him since, my goodness, but with Louis, when's the last time we saw you? RSM, he missed the cut, right? Actually, I think he withdrew. 101's a withdrawal. So it's it's been it's been a long time since we've seen Louie, and he's only played here twice, but both are really, really good finishes. I'll try to keep my rants short here, but Matt Fitzpatrick, I think we saw what we wanted to see last week. Played well at Pebble. Um, I don't think he's going to be all that popular this week just because of, of the way the pricing is shakes out, and he doesn't have uh, really any history around the waste management. But Webb Simpson's 86. What are we doing with Webb Simpson? I'm a buyer on Webb Simpson, and I'm a buyer for the whole year. Uh, you know, if I asked you what was Webb Simpson's season like last year, I think you'd have to say it was a disappointment. It was the first time in basically 10 or 11 years he didn't have a top three finish. Now, that's a disappointment. However, he was 12th on tour in strokes gained total, 1.2 strokes gained per round, 12th. He was better than Tony Finau. He was better than, uh, I can't remember the other names behind him, but he was very good, just did not have the results to show for it. And we saw flashes at the RSM, right? He gained nine and a half strokes on approach there. Um, if he is laying the, if he's kind of getting back to the baseline, getting back to his true DNA, Webb here is phenomenal, right? He's he's a, a past champion. He's he's played, like, let's just pull up his results. Waste management. You're going to see a lot of green here. I think he's only lost strokes T to green once, twice. Uh, twice in the last eight years, right? Winner in 2020, runner-up finish in 2017, a couple other top tens in there. This is a really great set of results. So I'm pretty much a buyer on Webb Simpson, but if he comes in super chalky, uh, because I'm so excited about him for the rest of the year, I think I could probably take a pass. What else do we have? Um, Seamus continues to be great. I know he struggled on the weekend. It was devastating to go from a five-shot lead with 36 to go to T9 or whatever he finished and just never found it at Pebble Beach. But he is still piling up top tens. The advanced metrics still very, very good for Seamus Power. Actually, I do want to see, because the two rounds that he struggled were both at... No, no. He shot a 74 at um, Monterey Peninsula. So that was not the two struggle rounds at... Pebble Beach, but I do want to see what he did. Oh, this is going to be a little bit skewed. Let me go to do this a different way. So a lot of people don't realize that you can still get strokes gain total numbers without it being a measured event, right? So that's what I, I you can just calculate that. So um, if sometimes you see it doesn't add up, you'll be like, wait, uh, approach plus off the tee plus putting plus around the green doesn't equal total. If it's an event where not every uh, course is measured, I'm still giving you the strokes gain total numbers uh, and the breakdown when they're available. So here is here is Seamus Power at Pebble Beach. So round two, he was phenomenal. You know, great approach play. He putted well. Uh, the the bad round that he had on Sunday wasn't horrible. He was within a stroke of zero in every single category. So it's really hard to be like, wow, power's done after what we've seen for really five or six months. So I'll, I'll be interested to see how he kind of responds to a close call this week. The rest of the AK, it's fine. Connors is fine. Henley's fine. Hoagie continues to play well. Will he finish inside the top five again? Unlikely, much more difficult field. He's got the first time winner, a little bit of a hangover. That's okay. Congratulations to you, Tom Hoagie. The 7K range is kind of interesting. It starts with Abraham Answer, which I think you could argue is he's he's too cheap. However, he hasn't been playing all that well. He did play. I want to go to his golfer profile page because that'll actually show. Uh, he did play the Saudi International last week, which was his his best uh, his best finish of the year. I, I think it might be his best finish since his victory. Let's check this out. 
T8, no, he had a T7 at Mayakoba. So it's his best finish of the calendar year, which has started really slow. He was really bad from T to green at the Tournament of Champions. He missed the cut at, in so at the Sony. The American Express, a place that he thrived, he finished T40, and then he went and played in a, um, a, a good top-heavy field at the Saudi International, finished T8. So maybe we are seeing kind of a little bit of a turnaround. I do wonder, though, you know, it's kind of easy to hit these greens. I wonder if Answer's skill set is magnified here. I don't think it is. So I kind of worry a little bit about Abraham answer just in terms of recent form and in terms of the way this, this course may set up for him. But, um, it's a pretty decent price. I was expecting him to be much more expensive, uh, expensive than that. Billy Horschel, again, he just never seems to get the credit for how well he's been playing. Um, it's the match play victory. It's the win on the European tour. It's the close call again a couple of weeks ago. I mean, he's just he's just been playing well. Um, he's doing it in a way that I don't love, which is why he doesn't make a lot of my lineups or investments in any way because he's been super super reliant on the short game in fact he's lost strokes on approach in his last three uh which were all measured events which is a little bit concerning but i do think he finds a way to put the ball in the cup maybe the most interesting guy in this entire pricing is taylor gooch uh let's pull up gooch here because he missed the cut at the three course rotation american express and i believe he was very very popular that week and it was easy for a lot of people to write him off and i think it was easy for a lot of people to write him off as a fall schedule hero and not that i believe he's kind of one of the better players you know at least one of the better ball strikers top 20 ball striker on the pga tour um made the cut finished t20 at the farmers the last time we saw him that's great he has lost strokes on approach once since may that is handy here, right? We talked about the course key stats. We talked about approach play being important. People kind of forgetting about Taylor Gooch. Let me just run this. Let's just run last 50 rounds. This is raw. Last 50 rounds, strokes gained approach, players in this field. Gooch is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, ninth. Ninth in this field. Behind the likes of Justin Thomas, Keegan Bradley, Victor Hovland, John Rahm. Daniel Berger, Russell Henley, et cetera, et cetera. Tom Hoagie sneaks into, the, actually he's tied with Tom Hoagie. No, no, Louis Ustazen is tied with him. So uh, I, I think he might be candidate for most mispriced because of w one bad start. I think that's the candidate for most mispriced. Uh, Matt McNeely withdrew this morning, so I'll remove him from the cheat sheet. Don't play him. Bottom of the 7K range, Kucher. Um, for you guys who know me, I'm not a Kucher guy. But it's off to a really good start this year. And he missed the cut last week, which is his first missed cut of the calendar year. I think he had made five or six in a row. He's showing a bit more consistency. He's showing, um, you know, the putter coming back a little bit. He's not driving it as poorly as he was at the end of last year. He's, his play in Phoenix, as I pull this up, all green, baby. Last year was the only year... Uh, measured in his measured back to 2009 that he lost strokes T to green. Otherwise, he's been great. T16, T4, T5, T9, T6 in 2019. These are all really good results. So I think I'll give I think I'll give Cooch one crack here. He's not someone that I'm usually backing, but I think it's a a, a fairly decent spot for him. I'll be quick on these on these three other guys here. So Knox is um, here's a little sneak peek in sneak oh god sneak peek into. Uh, my run good rundown, which is an email newsletter that I send out every single week. Um, this little nugget about Russell Knox will be in there. So let me just pull up Russell Knox here on the Holy Grail. And what I'll do is I will filter this by uh, Bermuda grass greens, which is what we've got here at TPC Scottsdale. And historically, Russell Knox is pretty bad on Bermuda. You can see there was a stretch from the RSM Classic in 2020 to the RBC Heritage in 2021 in which he st lost strokes putting every single event. It was like nine in a row. But since then, since then, since the Valspar, uh, he has gained in five of nine, better than 50% of the time. Pretty good. If he gets as close to like one and a half strokes game this week, he's already a great iron player. You can see that. Uh, dating back to the Players' Championship, which was, which was in March, he's lost strokes on approach once. It was the American Express, which is, that's just one measured round. And then he missed the cut. 
Moxie might be pretty decent here, and he's and he's played well when he's gotten to uh, when he's gotten to Phoenix. So that's what we're rooting for. We're rooting for a good Bermuda putting week. Uh, Cam Davis, I worry about. I, I'll I'll talk about this. I'm sure ad nauseum this week. You know, it's not necessarily Cam Davis specifically because I'm a huge Cam Davis fan. But guys like Cam Davis, which is um, if you're very wayward at a desert course, you introduce a lot more luck and a lot more volatility into your into your scores because you could be behind a cactus you could be in a bush you could be you could have your ball on a rock there's just like a lot of you could be in a footprint right like a, a sandy footprint like that's that's no good either right so when you are very wayward off the tee you introduce a lot more luck into the lie that you get uh, as opposed to just doing it at a course that just has rough everywhere. So that worries me uh, for Cam Davis and for guys like Cam Davis. Aaron Wise, I don't know how long, like I'm super bullish on Aaron Wise. He has to win this year. He has to. Is this the spot? Maybe, maybe not. He's 66 to 1, 70 to 1, depending on where you're looking. Um, I'll probably back him just because I'm a kind of a believer in what he's doing. And we are still seeing, again, even though it's one measured round, uh, but it was at the South Course at Torrey Pines, he gained strokes putting there. So now we've got four straight where he's gained strokes putting, five of six, six of eight. That is a stark contrast between everything else we've ever seen from him. And by the way, the T to green numbers are still very, very good. So um, I'll continue until that profile changes, I will be a backer of Aaron Wise. Let's go into the 6K range, and I think one of the better ways to do this is to just go back to the power rankings and, like, let's just objectively find the best players in the $6,000 range. So a couple different ways we can do it. I'm going to go to the weighted numbers, right? I, I, I believe in this calculation, and because it is a value, um, a value kind of tier, I, I probably want to keep the number of rounds pretty low. So let's just call it 24 rounds. It's sorted by weighted strokes gain total and let's just find the first guy in the 6k range it's michael thompson <laughs> i guess we probably could have guessed that he's 6700 dollars. he's the 23rd ranked player in this field sep straka is 26 he is yeah 6400 dollars. jason duffner there robert streb there hudson swafford nick taylor adam long these are names that i think are worth targets let's do um let's do the same thing but tita green I kind of want to see it this way. Okay, Sepp Straka. We're going to have to do a deep... He, he, he's popping up. We're going to have to do a deeper dive on Sepp Straka here, who, um, it, it, off my memory, is, is is much more volatile. Let's see what we've got. Okay, no, he's played... Okay, so really, he gets a big boom. <laughs> 24 rounds is probably exactly the right number of rounds to look at Sepp Straka, because if you go back any further than that, it's horrible, right? He loses seven at... Zozo, eight at the Shriners, eight and a half at the Fortinet. But if you just look at 24, it's a lot better. He actually has only lost strokes to the field twice. And then his last two are really good. Um, gaining 5.3 at the American Express, gaining 7.6 at the Farmers, uh, and finishing T16. You know, that's pretty impressive. It's not super sustainable, right? Four strokes he gains around the green at the Farmers. He gains four on the surfaces at the American Express. But you can kind of forgive it because he's gained strokes on approach in three straight and both of those two that I mentioned. So Straka looks to be playing a little bit better. That's why I like doing this, going to the power rankings, seeing what we find, and then going back to another tool and doing a little bit of a deeper dive. Um, Kramer Hickok is here. Let's do a Kramer Hickok dive because he is uh, generally, when he's playing well, he's playing out of the fairway, which is, um, it's going to be important here. You know, I mentioned that his, let's see, it's harder than average to hit fairways around here. So if you're playing out of the fairway, you're in, you've already got a leg up and you're not introducing yourself to that volatility. So let's see, missed the cut at the American Express, but uh, actually gained a, a 1.3 on the field. Rick, how is that possible? So the way that that is possible is again, because I'm giving you the strokes gain total numbers uh, broken down by each round and each course. So they're normalized to just people who played that course on that day, which is the correct way to do it. If you were on the wrong end of the draw, which it appears Kramer Hickok was, you actually gained 1.3 strokes on the field and missed the cut. It's a really kind of lucky, unlucky, crappy situation, but it's true. Uh, played well at the Sony, finished T20 there, gained in both ball striking categories, missed the cut at the RSM. That goes back to last year. So, okay, we've only seen him two times, and he's played, uh, I'd say he's played pretty good both of those times. So maybe Hickok is someone, does he have any history here? Does he have waste, waste management history? It doesn't look like it. Okay. 
um, someone that I could target. Anybody else here? Anybody else in the $6,000 range? Just kind of looking at, you know, history is pretty sticky around here. So if you get guys uh, with decent history, actually, I can go back to the Holy Grail and just show you uh, TPC Scottsdale and we can sort by strokes gain total and we can just look for guys in the 6K range. You know, that, that, those, those course history results are pretty sticky. Uh, Lashley's the first, or sorry, Neesmith shows up. He only has four rounds. He's, uh, he's played at one time. He finished T7. That was last year. Lashley has eight rounds. Finished 17th and third. Brendan Steele, 40 rounds. Wow. Brendan Steele's played this 10 times. He's made the cut eight times. He's gained strokes from tee to green eight times. Gained strokes ball striking every time. Last two, he's hemorrhaged strokes on the green. He lost five strokes putting and still finished T30 last year. That's pretty impressive. What's he up to recently? Let's do it. Let's just do the Brendan Steele deep dive and then we'll go and, and we'll run a model. Brendan Steele deep dive. Scary stuff. Scary stuff. Let's see. Missed the cut at the, uh, oh boy. Hemorrhaged at the American Express. Lost seven strokes to the field. Lost three and a half on approach at the Sony. Oh boy. This is not, I mean, maybe he can figure it out, but that is not the version of Brendan Steele you want. When you're losing strokes tee to green and ball striking with Steele, that's troublesome. So not as excited as I thought I was going to be, but that is the point of why we do these deep dives. Okay, let me run a model and I'll get you out of here. Okay, this is the custom model at rickrungood.com. Let's ooh, let's figure out what we want to do here. Um, less, let, less 24, we'll stick with that. I like that. Um, we'll clear my weights. I am going to do, uh, I'm going to live with weighted strokes gained approach 25 and weighted strokes gained off the tee 20. I am then going to do, uh, I'm just going to do 10 around the green and 10 on putting. So that gives me kind of like a weighted strokes gained total. I've used 65 of my weights. I'm then going to take my last 35 and I'm probably going to split them between par four scoring. So we have the extra par four this week, right? Because we've got uh, 11 fours four threes and three fives. So we've got 11 par fours. So I will do, um, how do I, I have 35 left. Let's do 20 on par four scoring, which leaves me 15 to put on DraftKings points. Well, I could do DraftKings points gained or I could do birdie or better. It's a, it's a fantasy point game, people. Let's do that. Um, and that leaves me with my number one golfer being, oh boy. No surprise, John Rom, Patrick Cantlay, number two. You know, like that, that makes sense, right? If I ran a model that was heavily weighted in weighted strokes gained and those guys weren't near the top, it would be a bit concerning. Now, the th but you look at the other names and you see, okay, who else is popping up here that I wouldn't have considered? Obviously, I would have considered John Rom and Patrick Cantlay. Russell Henley's next. $8,200 Russell Henley. Sam Burns is fourth. That gives me a little bit more confidence, quite frankly, in Sam Burns. And... The fact that he's a lot cheaper than some of those other guys at the top. Uh, Justin Thomas is five. Aaron Wise is six. Okay. Scotty Scheffler, seven. I probably would not have given Scheffler that much of a boost. Berger, eight. See, that if Berger plays, I think he's either I think he's going to win everybody all the money, right? Because he's going to be like the 3% owned guy who's been elite for a year. Scary. Power is nine and Ustazen is 8,800 or is, is 10. He's $8,800. So that's interesting. Gooch is 12, Hideki is 11, Xander and Victor are 13 and 14. So um, this is fascinating stuff because I probably will convince myself to now be overweight on, on probably Louis, maybe Berger, depending on the news that we get. Uh, I'll do a deep dive on Russell Henley. There's some things that I can do. I've got a little bit of homework coming out of this. And obviously, um, We'll cover this in full, you know, throughout the rest of the week. There's a Tuesday scramble. Andy and I are going to go through a lot of betting stuff. That's uh, Tuesday noon Eastern on the Rick Run Good YouTube channel. It's live, so you can join the conversation. I'll do Twitter spaces Tuesday and Wednesday night. I'll do uh, the Wednesday live chat. That's 3 p.m. Eastern time. Ask questions there. There'll be a jock market power hour. That's 8.15 on Wednesday. Lots of good stuff coming. So we've got a lot to talk about. I've got my homework, but I'm going to wish you guys a great week. Best of luck, and I'll talk to you soon.